Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell. Boy, that's a powerful truth. Aren't you glad that God doesn't throw the clay away? There would not be any of us left around. Well, maybe some of you, but I wouldn't be here. No, none of us would be around here. I'm so glad for God's grace, his mercy, compassion. Boy, I love that truth. Love that song. Thank you, Miss Mitchell. Well, we have some handouts tonight for you for the notes, and so I don't think anyone has them yet, so don't bother raising your hand because you don't have one yet. I think I have one up here, and so I think the teenagers can come up here and they'll pass it out for you. And while they pass those, those handouts out, if you could then turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 Timothy, book of 1 Timothy, as we, as we continue on our series on church. We've looked the last few weeks, number of weeks, on what church or what is church. And now I'd like to turn our attention on which church. Why this church? Why do we come to First Baptist Church? We'll get those handouts. Thank you, young people, for passing those out. Appreciate that help very much. Appreciate all the folks who help out and serve around here at First Baptist Church. And you'll notice, if you were here on Sunday and a little bit tonight, that our sound system has some gremlins in it. Right? That is not the sound men's fault right now. The sound system has been acting up for a little bit of time. And about a month ago, I called the sound technician in, the company in, and they said, well, you're going to need some new equipment. And so I promptly ordered it, and they promptly emailed me and said it was promptly on back order. And so we're promptly waiting for this equipment to come, and that'll help us. And so I appreciate your patience along the way. Anytime the sound doesn't work, right, everyone looks at the sound guy. I've been there. I've broken out a dead sweat before. And uh, what's going on? And I even hate to mention to have them turn it up or down, but it, I know that's, uh, it's uh, difficult, and that's a, that's a thankless job. They say the best sound guy is one that no one notices. But we need a good sound, a sound guy or gal here at First Baptist Church. And you know, Miss, Miss Jenny has, has helped in that capacity as well. We appreciate that so much. In the process of getting that equipment, we'll be able to upgrade those who are on live stream, our sound for live stream. You'll notice that right now, when we, if you're on live stream, the services are mixed for in here, which is different than the mics actually sound. Uh, in those few weeks that we were at home and uh, you were at home and we were here, we had uh, the, the sound men, uh, they mixed the sound for at home and it sounded terrible. Terrible in here, but good at home. Well, now this, this new equipment allows us to do both at the exact same time, and I think it further the, the, the cause of Christ here. So we're looking forward to that. It'll come eventually, and when it comes, it comes. Like they say, it is. It is. I just said it. I don't know about you, all you negative people here tonight. Well, I'm glad you're here. First Timothy chapter number three tonight, as we continue on this concept, which church? In First Timothy chapter number three, we looked at this passage a few weeks ago when we looked at the qualifications for pastors and deacons, for bishops and deacons. We went through these qualifications in First Timothy chapter three. At the end of First Timothy chapter three, Paul gives to Timothy a couple of broad concepts. Now I tell you that to remind us of the context of the chapter. When I share this verse, it is in the context of a church setting. All right, I'm not just grabbing this verse out of thin air. Uh, though verses can stand alone, the Bible says all verses, I think, work together. No scripture is of any private interpretation, but the truth of God's word can stand all by itself. You say, how do you know that? Because Jesus did that. Jesus, when he spoke, he would just quote part of a verse, and he did not give any context. He did not give any background. He just stated it as fact. In fact, he never changed it. He just quoted it. So it's okay to quote just one verse and say, that's the word of God, and it's true. But the scripture does work just like this, and that's wonderful for you and for me. We can see it work together. So as we come to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, we know that we're in the context of a church because he's been talking about the offices of a church, the bishop and the deacon. He comes down, if you look in your Bibles there, it's in your notes as well, but I'd love you to have your Bible open. And uh, he says this in verse number 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon, kind of bring us back to that context, well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus these things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, but just in case I get delayed, Timothy, if I can't be there, and I'd love to just give you these things in person, you're my son in the faith, you've grown in the faith, I've encouraged you in the faith, and I just want to just give you a hug, like Paul's saying. I just want to give you a hug and talk to you and just really strengthen you. But if I get delayed, if I tarry long, he says, basically, I'm going to give you a couple of of truths. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know 
how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Lord, I pray that during these next few moments that you would touch us and meet with us. Lord, would you make these truths from your word to be clear and evident to us? Lord, I've tried to do my part studying, but I can't do anything without you. You've clearly told all of us without you we can do nothing but lord i pray you'd help us tonight help us to be good listeners good soil lord i pray for the different elements of the church lord the sound system would work well tonight not distract us lord we sure love you and we are so thankful for what you're doing here at this church lord guide this time now in jesus name i ask amen paul says timothy if i get held up If I get delayed, I'm going to give you some truth for how you ought to behave in the house of God. Now, we are inside of a time period where good people are deciding to switch Bible versions to make verses they quote more understandable. The Bible here says, I'm going to tell you how you ought to behave in church. Guess what the word behave means here in the scripture? Behave. Behave. If you wanted to, you could use the word how to act in church. Now, I'll just, that is floor you, right? I went to Bible college to be able to explain that to you. You could read your Bible and understand that right there. And Paul says, I'm going to help you to know how to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Verse 16, just a powerful powerful verse for us. Verse 16, often changed in the new translations. Often changed, and the the word God, Jesus Christ, is demeaned in the new translations in verse number 16. It is an awful travesty. One of the reasons that we use the King James Version, and most likely somewhere along the way, I'll probably go back through it. Pastor Led has written a tremendous book. If you've never read it, you ought to read it. I'm not saying that just because he's he's here. I'm going to teach through it in Bible class. I've taught it for, I think, uh, boy, how many years now? When, When would you write that book, Pastor? A long time ago. (laughs) Um, I probably taught it about 12, 13 years. In fact, I've taught through that book so much, I probably know the book better than Pastor Led. No, no. (laughs) He knows the Bible better than me, but it's, no. Um, But man, the powerful truth. But the Bible here says that the church is the church of the living God. It is the pillar and ground of the truth. As we come into this concept, which church? We must start from the foundation that the church that was established by God himself, church is not man's idea, church is not my idea, church is not a social, just a social gathering, church was God's idea, and he says it is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now these two verses link just like this together, and some would say, well that pillar and ground of the truth, that's just referring to verse number 16. Uh, what it says about Jesus Christ, that without controversy, great is the mystery of God, that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached down to the Gentiles, believed down in the world, received up into glory. And that is, I think, true, but equally as true in the construction of these verses, that where it says the pillar and ground of the truth is tied directly. That phrase is tied directly to the previous phrase, which is the church. You see, when we look at the church... We must look how that the church has clear, a clear connection and commands from God about truth. When we look at the church, we must look at the clear connection and the commands from God about truth and his church. There are a whole bunch of churches out there. In America, I found that there are, they say there are 380,000 churches churches, religious gatherings in America, or about one church for about every thousand people, right in there. In Michigan, in Michigan, there are 9,000 
521 religious congregations in Michigan. Or in Michigan, about one religious congregation for every 1,040 people. Of those, or in those 9,521 religious congregations, in the state of Michigan, it has about 9.9 million people, almost 10 million people in Michigan. 4.2 million people in Michigan are registered at a church, a religious gathering. About half, or not, just a little bit under half, are registered at a church. But not everyone goes to church, right? But many people claim to be a part of a church. We find that even here at First Baptist Church, people go into the hospital and they'll ask, which church? And I'm thankful that they say, my church is First Baptist Church. Throughout my time here, I've visited many people that I have never, ever met before, but claimed our church is First Baptist Church. I don't mind that at all. I have a chance to give the gospel. I have a chance to encourage someone, bring some hope to them. There's no problem. I told a story a few weeks ago about the lady I met at, 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 a, at a local a supermarket. She had cash register, gave her a track, invited her to church. And, um, and she said, well, I go to that church. <laughs> well, I'm J.D. Howell. Nice to meet you. <laughs> People claim to be part of church, and, and they may, may, uh, may more claim here than, than here. In Saginaw County, in Saginaw County, 266 churches in Saginaw County. In our county, I think they said there's about 190,000 people, so if my math is correct, about one church for every 750 people in Saginaw County. There are a lot of churches, loosely, out there. All types of churches. And the Bible says and commands to us in the word of God, and not all the churches use the word of God, we'll look at some of that tonight, but in the word of God, the Bible says that the church is entrusted with the business of maintaining the truth, of defending the truth, and of transmitting the truth. The truth is upheld by the church, and, and, and the people of the world, the unsaved, have no interest in the truth. In fact, in this day and age, truth is relative. Whatever you want it to be, that's what it's supposed to, allow, to, to be allowed to be. If you want to be someone else, you can be someone else. If you want to do whatever you want to do, your, your thoughts are fine. You are truth. There's no absolute truth. It's only relative. But the Bible says that the church is tied, connected, and commanded about the truth. On your notes right there, I want to see a few things. First of all, to the call, to the call to the church. The call to the church. The first call to the church, I find in this passage, the church is called to be supported by the truth. The church is, uh, of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground uh, have the idea of a foundational support. We have four pillars in this auditorium. Two of them run all the way up, two run to the balcony. We don't want to knock any of them down. Because pillars typically support something, right? In your house, you try to build a house on a strong foundation. Jesus talked about that with sand and rock. Obviously uh, giving us the idea, and we know this, you those are builders, that sand is not a good foundation. The church, the pillar and ground of the truth, the church is called to be supported by the truth. What, how that applies to us is that at the church, at any church that's going to be a biblical church, a Bible-believing church, a God-honoring church, we must do what we do because of the truth. We must be supported by the truth. We ought to operate by the truth. Where do we find the truth? We find it clearly in the Word of God. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the truth. Now, as we come to church, there will be some things that are done because of convenience and tradition. That does not mean that they are necessarily bad. About a year and a half ago, I transitioned. You voted for me a little before that, about three or two and a half years ago, you voted for me about a year after that, for me to become the pastor of First Baptist Church. For as long as I can remember my time here at First Baptist Church, First Baptist Church has taken the offering at the end of the service. 
it is a long-standing tradition at First Baptist Church. Many churches take it right smack dab in the middle of the service. It was early my time early here, I asked pastor why we took it at the end. I wasn't complaining, wasn't arguing, just curious. Why is it at the end? It always, every other church I've been to, been right in the middle of the service. You know, you're singing, you're worshiping God, and er, stop, offering time. And pastor explained why he believed that was a good thing for us to do as a church. Well, if you noticed, we still take the offering at the end of the service. Now, when we were online only during, during that COVID time, we took the offering in the middle of the service. Whoa, oh, whoa, whoa, oh, pastor, I'm just looking at my Bible here and uh, yikes, uh, it says somewhere often be the end. Well, no, no, we take it there by some sense of tradition. It's not wrong to take it at the end. I think it's biblical from the Bible to take an offering at church. First Corinthians chapter number 16, I see that at church. That's where we take the offering during a church service. But when it's at the beginning or the end or the middle, that's something of tradition. We start our services on Sunday, Sunday school at 10 o'clock. Main service at 11 o'clock. Why do we start that at 11 o'clock? Why not 11.05? Why not 11.35? Why not 12? Why not 1? Well, some of that is a little bit of just what is practical and works well. I'll tell you right now, there's nothing in the Bible at what time you must start your service. If I found out that we could double the crowd Sunday morning and start it at 11.06. You better believe the next Sunday, 11.06, church is starting. And not a moment before and not a moment after. 11.06 on the, on the button, we're starting. And so there are going to be some things that are going to be t traditional or convenience, and I would never defend them as biblical, but what we must do must be based on Bible principles. We have a principle to have a service, and we ought to have more than one service. We have a principle that as we get closer to Jesus Christ, we ought to have more services, not less services. All right, And so we're looking at these things and try to base these things on the Bible, but along the way there's going to be some maybe practical things or things that are, are not anti-biblical, and we wouldn't want to defend them that way either. The church, though, is called to be supported by the truth. We, when we looked at the, the qualifications, I mentioned that I don't believe in a lady being a pastor. That's not true throughout all of Saginaw. Some churches believe differently on that. I believe I can support mine right from Scripture, why a lady should not be the pastor of a church. There are some people who graduated from Bible colleges and some good Bible colleges who struggle with that same concept. And I hear what they say. Some of those ladies are gifted speakers, gifted speakers. I was close once to a, to a, to a lady pastor, and she's a, a gifted speaker. And the problem being that I think the Bible kind of forbids it. it. Wasn't against her talent, though. She was talented, very talented. But we have to be supported by the truth Supported by what God says, the church is called to be supported by the truth. But the, number two, the church is called to speak the truth. Church is called to speak the truth. This is not just a social gathering. We're not just going to have a little bit of a, a good time or a comedy routine up here. Now, sometimes I'll tell some jokes. Even less times you'll laugh at them. I don't mind laughing in church. There are some churches who believe that you should not have any laughter that, that you must approach God with such seriousness that, that there is no place for any humor in church. In my Bible, I find some humorous things sometimes. I'll be reading my Bible and I'll laugh out loud at what God does or what he says. It's funny. It's funny. I find that word joy includes a smile. Right? Is, is that hard to connect? All right, you don't have to switch versions for that either, do you? The joy includes a smile. In fact, you can tell when someone's joyful usually. You can tell when someone's happy. You go to work Monday morning and you can say, oh. Well, how do you know that? Before they've said a word. And then they open their mouth and it just confirms what you already saw with your eyes. And someone else comes bounding and leaping in the door. And you're like, oh, Great. They have not said a word yet, but you've already turned to your computer. You've turned to your station. You're already saying, no, I don't want that joy in my life this morning. Uh, we're, we're called to, to speak the truth, and the Bible has some very clear things. In Ephesians chapter 4, the verses are there in your notes, but speaking the truth in love. 
may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now look at that, verse 15 talks about speaking the truth in love, but look at where verse 16 talks about, where it goes. For whom the whole body fitly joined together. That's talking about the church, the body of Jesus Christ. He talks in 15, speaking the truth in love, and in verse 16, talking about the interaction of church. The church is connected again to the truth, and we're called to speak the truth with love, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Just on a side note here, we'll get there in the very last session on, on, why, on why church. All right? And that, but that's going to be more of here's where the rubber meets the road. But all of us, as part of a church, have an obligation, a place of service, a place that we can meet some needs. And the Bible talks about how your body works just like this. And when it works well, your body works smoothly, you feel good. But some of us are are past the point of feeling good when you wake up in the morning. Oh, my knee. Oh, the elbow. Some of us have a, have a great story every time at church. How are you doing? Let me tell you how I'm doing, Pastor, and you give me a nice long list of how you're doing. And the body's not fitly joined together. Some aches and pains. And I feel badly for you. And you feel badly for you. In the church... When we have aches and pains, it feels bad. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be where the joint just, oh man, I feel like a new man. That was great. Popped out of bed. Not like some of you men after the alumni game felt the next day. Oh, oh, whoa, ah. According, end of verse 16, to the factual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Love at the beginning of verse 15, love at the end of verse 16, this truth is wrapped in love. When we speak the truth, you ought to wrap it in love. Well, I love to speak the truth. That's not what I mean. That's not what I mean. The truth with love, you know, truth comforts. Truth comforts. We have some real needs right now in our church. Truth comforts. Has no place. Listen, you, you may have ideas on, on why people suffer. Keep them to yourself. I could have told you you're going to have a hard time because I saw you two weeks ago. I knew it was going to be rough for you. Keep it to yourself. Truth comforts. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know it's hard right now, but just remember out of Isaiah that God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. I read that this morning in my devotions. I wrote in the little margin, my thoughts are not equal to God's thoughts. My ways are not equal to his ways. Mine are way down his, and his, you can't even see them. The truth in love, truth comforts. Sometimes truth confronts. With love with love. Hey, can I, can I say something to you? Can I have a tough conversation with you? Boy, I just, uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Boy, you see this sometimes on social media. It plays out in church as well. Social media, somebody will put a nice selfie on there. Well, I'm sorry, not a nice selfie. I misspoke. A terrible selfie. Angle's wrong, the makeup's wrong, sorry ladies. The outfit's wrong, it's all wrong. You say, who do you know, Pastor Howell? Well, for a few years, my wife and I took photography and we took pictures and so we're not experts, but we got paid a little bit. And, but it's all wrong and what does everybody say? Uh, they say, oh, I like that. Oh, you go, girl, beautiful, wow, stunning. And then what do you do, you ladies? Oh, did you see this? Wow. <laughs> Wow, boy, truth with love. Sometimes it confronts. Truth confides individually, and truth changes. Truth changes. The point of truth is for change. 
That's why we give the gospel. The gospel is the truth. It's about Jesus Christ. We hope that the gospel transforms, changes someone. At church, we come to church and I try to speak the truth from, the, from, the, from God's word for the idea that it'll change us. I want God's word to change me. And truth brings a change, but I want it to bring the right kind of change. See, the church is called to be supported by the truth. The church is called to speak the truth. And the church is called to strive for the truth. Jude, verse 3, only one chapter there. Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Truth is something that we must be passionate about. It's not okay to be in error. Now understand, as I go through some of these things, and we'll get a little bit further tonight, not too far, but we'll get a little bit further. I'll probably say some things that has the, append- the potential to offend some people. That is not my intention. I'm not here to say, let me tell you about what's wrong in Saginaw County. It's all these churches. There's 266 churches and 265 bad churches. There's one good church. That's not why I'm up here. That's not why I'm up here. And if you take that clip out of YouTube, you'll play the rest of this clip as well. All right, listen, there's many churches in Saginaw County that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for the gospel. Moses had the situation, that Jesus had the situation where someone was not, you know, right there and, and they were glad for the truth to go out. At the same time, Jesus is the truth. He cares about the truth and he wants us to care about it and be passionate about the truth. I'm not afraid to say that I believe when we worship God, there's some ways we ought to worship him and there's some ways we ought not to worship him. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm not afraid to say, listen, the Bible's not for a woman pastor. I'm not afraid to say that. It's a truth from God's word. If that offends somebody, I'm sorry. That's not my intent to offend you, but if the truth offends you. You meet some people who are passionate about the truth, but are also passionate about offense. You met these people? Let me tell you what's wrong with America today, and they go off on a hole. and not even go down that rabbit trail because it just, when you say those things, it puts you in a bad spirit. Does it not? Boy, you've heard and I've heard, and they can rant and rave about anything and everything. They just have a bitter spirit and an angry spirit, and and all in the name of truth, in the name of truth. We can be kind, can we not? We can be kind, and it doesn't mean we have to compromise. You can be kind and not compromise. The number of good men and women serving God in Saginaw. That doesn't mean we ought to go to those churches. I disagree with them because of truth. And I'm going to strive for the truth. I'm going to be passionate about the truth. When it snows and we have church, I'm going to say we have church on snow days. And then I'll say you ought to have church on snow days. I'm going to say that. And sure enough, there's going to be someone else in another church who's going to think we're foolish. They've already said this. You don't care about people's safety. Well, I do. I care about the eternal safety. Last time I checked, you can get in a car accident any day of the week. Any day of the week. People have car accidents when there's no snow out there. Now, if you're, if you're elderly or you have poor vision and you can't drive in the snow, I'm not fussing at you. I mean, you've heard me. I don't fuss at you for that. Right? But I can fuss at other places who say, well, this is what we got to do. Listen, I'm going to be passionate for the truth. I'm going to be passionate about the word of God. I don't like the fact of, of, of other good churches switching versions and acting like we're the problem. We're the problem. Like, like what's wrong with you, Brother Howell? Because you're still using what you always used. I say, what? I'm be passionate about that. Well, I think it's silly when, when I think it's silly when someone says, well, we have to we switch something because people can't understand the King James. You're right. You're right. There's a real number of things you can't understand in here. Mystery of God, in case you're wondering. There'll also be some big words that you don't understand and that I don't even sometimes like, what does that word mean? My daughter, Danielle, reads from, wait for it, the King James Bible. 
and she writes down things she learns. Wow, look at that. She started when she was five doing that. And you know what? Sometimes she goes, Daddy, what does this word mean? And they say, Danielle, this is what this word means. Sometimes I'm not there and she skips me and just asks Alexa. <laughs> Look at that. I read recently about a man who was decided to switch Bible versions. I don't know how I got on this rant and rave, but I'm there, so I'm going to stay there for, for a couple minutes. And he said that he, he, one reason he was switching is that he had to sometimes spend 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes in a sermon, a 40-minute sermon, explaining the Word of God. Wow. Can you imagine a pastor having to take 10 minutes to explain the Word? Can you believe that? 10 minutes. I just can't tell stories for 10 minutes. I have to explain the Word of God for 10 minutes. Are you kidding me? I... I I love studying the Word of God. I get paid to study the Word of God. And I love trying to explain it. I don't always do a good job. I know that. And sometimes I'll be preaching. I'll be like, oh my goodness, I'm in the weeds and I've lost every one of you. I've lost myself. <laughs> good heavens, I've got to get back on track here. I love if the Lord would help me sometimes to take maybe a, a truth from God's Word that maybe is a little more uh, deep or heavy and be able to break it down for us and, and explain it. I tried to explain the night. I took about four and a half to five minutes to explain the context of First Timothy chapter 3. Boy, if I can, what a waste of time. I don't think so. It builds, it builds a foundation. The truth, Christians are called, the church is called to strive for the truth. Well, I just don't like that. I'm sorry you don't like that. I'm sorry. We're called to strive for it, but we're not called to be mean-spirited about it. Don't forget, it's called, it's about love. And there are going to be people that you meet from other, other good churches and good people, and you love them. And, and, and I got to meet some people recently that, that would be different than us in a lot of things, and I got to be kind to them. I didn't have to tell them, you listen to me, I know where you and I are different. What does it matter? They know that. I know that. I can be kind. I can be kind. It doesn't mean that I'm going to preach there, they're going to preach here. That's okay. We can be kind in that. But, I, but I'm not going to back down on the truth. I'm not going to say it's okay. I'm not going to act like they have a valid point. Some of these new versions, I tell you what, the words aren't any more clear. They're not any more clear. I shouldn't say this, but I probably will now. The Bible talks about <laughs> the, the Bible talks about how we have an inheritance. The Bible says it's incorruptible. Incorruptible. You know what that means? Doesn't corrupt. You get that? Incorruptible. You know what that, if, if you didn't quite get that, it means it doesn't decay. If you're going down the road and you see a deer and some crows sitting on that deer, that flesh has begun to decay our inheritance doesn't decay it's incorruptible apparently that was too confusing so the word that some new versions use is imperishable imperishable you know what imperishable means i have no idea <laughs> i don't know how imperishable makes it any more clear than incorruptible but incorruptible i can figure that out Boy, be passionate about the truth. I'm passionate about what we do here at First Baptist Church and why we do it. And there's going to be some times along the way because I'm a human and, and you're human that we may maybe move a little bit and say, oh, that's not where we're supposed to be. The Bible says this. We'll come back and we'll say, oh, boy, you know what? We took that step. We don't like that. We'll be right back here. We want to follow the, the Bible. But we're going to be passionate about the truth, but we're going to love with the truth. If someone comes and says, listen, I believe you can get to heaven just by being really good, we're going to be loving about it, but we're not going to say, oh, that's nice. We're going to say, no, you know what? Boy, that's a great, that, that, that's, a, that's a good thought. But Jesus says this. We're going to be loving. Let me show you from God's word. Be passionate about the truth. It's not just okay, but we're not going to be mean-spirited about it. I know, boy, I wanted to get further tonight, but I didn't get much further. If you got anything else, remember this. The church has clear connections and a clear command from God about the truth. When we look at this whole concept, why this church, we're going to come from the foundation of truth, right? Not just what I think, not just what you think, not just what you heard uh, on TV, but what the truth 
is. With God's help, we'll be a church that is a pillar and ground of the truth.